Hey everyone, this is Dr. Casey Johnson. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I know you're going to love today's episode with Dr. Peter Risenon. Dr. Peter is doing some incredible work and has an amazing story, so I'm excited to have him on to share it with you guys. If you've been loving the Unlock Wellness Podcast, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. Also, be sure to follow me on social media to keep up with the latest podcast episodes. The best way to connect with me is on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. My username across the board is at Dr. Casey Johnson. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. You can also check out my website at drcaseyjohnson.com. It has all of the past podcast episodes and more information about each guest under the Listen tab. While you're on my site, be sure to check out the Shop tab where you can check out my first book of my Healthy Children's Book series. Thank you again for listening. I hope this episode leaves you feeling inspired to start making positive changes to your health. Now it's time for today's episode. I hope you love my conversation with Dr. Peter Risenon. Welcome to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey and excited for today's guest. I'm here with Dr. Peter Risenon. And big shout out to past guest, Dr. Ben Benulis, for connecting me with Dr. Peter. Dr. Ben is also doing some amazing work. So be sure to go back and check out our episode as well. But Dr. Peter's story is incredible. After experiencing a near-death traumatic brain injury, he decided to take his health and healing to the next level. He started implementing a plant-based diet and became fascinated with the powerful effects of fasting and the effects that it has on the body's overall healing abilities. Since then, he has healed and is now changing the lives of his patients and has even rode his bike across the entire country, which I know we're going to dive into because it's just all amazing. But I'm excited to have Dr. Peter on to share his amazing story and just all of the incredible work that he's doing. So Dr. Peter, thank you so much for taking time to come on. I'm excited to have you. Hey, thanks, Casey. So great to be here. I really love what you're doing for people and the stuff that you're putting out there. You're really changing people's lives. So I really have to hand it to you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the kind words. And I, like I mentioned in your intro, your story is incredible. So before we dive into everything that you're doing right now, why don't you walk us through your backstory leading up to your injury? You know, like first off, where you're from, and then also what your health and wellness looked like prior, so we fully understand just how you've completely transformed your health. Yeah, it's first I have to say, you know, working with people, I think every single person's story is absolutely amazing, and everyone comes with some sort of gems, and I take it into my life each and every day to want to learn from all those people around me because I feel like every single person in my life has something that is every every single person I meet has something that's more amazing than anybody else that's in this world. So it's kind of interesting. I don't think any part of single part of my story is probably the greatest of anything, but it's just an interesting story nonetheless. And I and I think that it's unique. Yeah, I grew up in um so I was born in nothing like that. You know, I don't want to take you back to being born and all that, but <laughs> was <laughs> was pretty much raised here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we moved here when I was about 13. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota for about, you know, for five years of my life. And we moved here and um, I'm the oldest of eight children. So I grew up in a large family where, you know, faith, hope, and love are, you know, were the most amazing things that we, we were brought up with those principles first and foremost. And I was always the really heavy set kid. You know, I was the kid who, when we moved here from Minnesota, I just didn't fit in. Everyone is swimming all the time here. And I became a little more self-conscious as a kid. I was, I always wore Husky clothing and had the, you know, the man boobs going on and everything like that. And as a young kid, it became something where I was around a lot of skinny, you know, skinny, scrawny kids who could eat anything that they wanted to. And they, you know, got away with it. So go to high, get all the way to high school and high school for me was you know, I kind of flourished academically. So I kind of stood out as a, you know, a kid who was, I, I love my teachers and I did my work and I did good work. But then, oh, I remember I, I sw- went into Safeway one day and I was looking through the magazine section and I flipped through men's health and I'm like, wow, hydroxy cut. No kidding. I'm looking at this <laughs> advertisement of this lean shredded guy. 
And I'm like, abs, huh? I'm like, that would be a dream come true. And it was all just like, take a pill, man. Got right into it, submitted my order to HydroxyCut, got it. And it was kind of like on, you know, secretive thing for me and abused that, you know, essentially started taking that when I was around, you know, 16 up until I was 18, three times a day, not really taking any breaks from it and became very, very essentially anorexic and underweight, obsessed about my you know, physique, always still feeling like I was fat, but yet I was super skinny. Do you have any like negative side effects from taking it that looking back, you know that that was happening because you were taking that so often? Absolutely. No, there was, there was a good period of, of time where I would, you know, I was working really early in the morning. What I would do here was kind of like a daily routine is I'd wake up at like set my alarm clock for five and I'd wake up and I'd pop two caps or something like that take some drink some water and I'd go back to sleep and I'd set my alarm clock for half an hour later and I'd just bounce out of bed when my alarm clock would go off because it, you know, it had fully gotten incorporated into my system and my physiology was responding. And so at the end of the day though, I would come home, I would like, I'd come home from work or anything and, and you know, the warm Arizona sun and it had a diuretic properties to it, everything else. I was so fatigued. And for me, the end of the days, I would, I would absolutely fall asleep of exhaustion really early, nearly every day. And I knew why I was fatigued. I knew I was having issues, but you know, there was just that drive to, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, it was really weird. Is there a lot of this random question? Is there like a lot of caffeine in hydroxy cut? Is that one of the main components is, is you know, in, is like that's a good ca- caffeinated type of mix or I, 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 a, I can't even remember <laughs> the ingredients of hydroxy cut. Well, th- in the original formula, I think there was mostly, um, I think it was mostly a Fedra Seneca. Okay. Um, so not, to what's called nowadays, there's a different type of ephedra called Mormon, Mormon tea, and that's a different type of ephedra. That's not the type of tea that I'm talking about. I'm talking about, or the herb that I'm talking about, I'm talking about ephedra Seneca. And it's been banned in the States uh, right. because of those athletes that have died. But in the original formula, I think it was just ephedra Seneca and caffeine. And then I also dosed up with, you know, I'd always drink it, swish it down with black coffee. Right. <laughs> So, you know, just to like really add the effect. So essentially it knocked out my appetite for the whole day. I mean, I was living off of protein shakes, uh, just whey protein because I didn't want any extra carbs. And then I was doing like, you know, crackers with eggs and I was just eating lots of like meat and vegetables, pretty much meat and vegetables and protein shakes is all I was living off of and counting my calories at the same time. So graduation came and I had a little bit left in my glove box and I had signed up for this just something sounded like super crazy, super awesome. And it was an adventure of a lifetime. I figured I'm like, Hey, my buddy, uh, a good, well, my cousin Grant had been a student manager selling books door to door for a company called the Southwestern company. And I'm like, that sounds so intriguing. I'm just like heard, you know, he, he had an awesome summer. He sold a lot of books. It was a lot. It was really hard work. He learned how to be like a door to door professional. He had the, he was like the best attitude anybody had ever known of anybody. You know, it was just like, just an upstanding stellar guy. It's like, if I can be like Grant and I don't have to like, you know, and I can get myself out of this situation with this, with just drug and just like be an amazing person. How can I, if this is the ticket out, I want to do it. So I knew it was going to be tough work. And the day after graduation from high school, I jumped in my car, my little Toyota Tercel and bombed towards uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where Southwestern's headquarters is and did a week of sales training. And that began like the most amped up summer of my life. It was just like, it was all atti- positive attitude and affirmations and positive habits and you know all these That's things awesome. that yeah it just transformed my life in one summer really and I actually kind of just forgot about the ephedra which is really weird but I just like forgot about it because I had so much more like amazing stuff on my mind. That's awesome. I mean, that's I, like there's so many sales jobs like that and so many companies really take pride in the self development that come from that. And it's really, I mean, I'm sure that's shaped your entire life, just having that level of self-development at a younger age, because, you know, I discovered that just that kind of like this, that want of like, whether it's reading or listening to things or learning more about self-development is how much it can affect your entire life. So getting that dose, that young of a person, I mean, I'm sure that's just helped you with everything. It has. And it's transformed the way I kind of look at life. And I know, you know, when I've that summer, I don't think I got debriefed very well. (laughs) So I came off of sale, you know, after selling kind of like 
high on life and high on the world. And like the first time I heard someone say that sucks, I was like, what? Like, <laughs> dude, like that's not the way life works, you know? And it's, so it's really funny. You kind of get fully incorporated back into life. You're like, okay, there's going to be people that say that sucks. And it's okay to say it too, if you really right. mean it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, cause you just, I took that summer as like, okay, well, this is going to, you know, I'm just going to take these principles and apply them in my life and I'm not going to change. And I realized like, okay, I was took it a little bit too far because those are principles you need when you're doing a door to door job where you work in 85 to 90 hours a week, knocking right. on, you know, it was, it was a long summer, but it was an amazing summer. So, but in that summer, what ended up happening, you know, I, I transformed my attitude and my, my vision going forward about what I wanted out of life. But at the same time, I gained back like 35 to 40 pounds that summer and just kind of eating standard American diet food. Cause I figured, well, I'm not going to worry about this stuff anymore. I'm just going to let it go. Right. And so I ended up getting back into like, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, you know, eggs and eggs and toast and coffee and, you know, just everything that, you know, lots of refined products, granola bars, um, whatever I kind of felt like eating, I just ate it because, and I figured, well, I'm so stressed out with just learning how to be a great salesperson that, you know, the stress of the job definitely took a toll as well, but I was eating out of comfort too. So what ended up happening after that summer is I was like, wait a minute, like I took stock of the situation, I had a better, more clear thinking head on my shoulders. And I said, okay, I got to find a strategy by which I can have a healthy lifestyle, keep this good head on my shoulders, not lose it, because this is a treasure to have. But at the same time, like, how can I develop healthier habits? So switching kind of back to like, I dip right back into low carb, because as like a you know, teenager, I was doing Atkins because everyone I knew was doing Atkins. So it's like, well, figured it was just like, let's just go back to Atkins, right? So tried the, you know, the Atkins diet and signed up for a year to go to Finland. So what ended up happening is our church puts out a scholarship to go to a folk school in Finland. And I applied for the scholarship the summer right after I finished selling books, I got it and just left promptly to Finland and really immersed myself in the Finnish culture, learning the language, you know, cross country skiing, you know, playing all kinds of things like floorball and doing ceramics and artwork and studying religion and doing choir and lots of, you know, amazing different things in life that I'd really never, you know, been exposed to. And then I came back and got a job working in a hospital. And this is kind of where my career kind of started forming in and of itself as I came back from Finland and I got a job at the hospital I had a quick interlude at the golf course, but realized that that wasn't going to be a lifetime job. And at the hospital, I worked in the intensive care unit and I just saw so much death and suffering and my heart just went out to all those people that were in there. I remember late nights working some, some I didn't work overnights, but some nights I worked till late in the evening, part of the night shift would come on and then I would leave. But I remember wrapping up, you know, zipping up body bags and wow. doing that on my own, pulling out all the tubes and, and the lines and respectfully taking care of the body, but being there for the the end and the passing of some of these people who didn't weren't didn't have any family or friends or anybody to be with them during their last hours. It's awful. Yeah, and that really transformed my my view of okay, if I can help people, and if I can be myself, but I can help people in their lives, I want to do something kind of like I want to be around these people because it fed my soul, and I was able to give back in ways that I didn't even know that I I didn't know I had it in me to give. So that kind of trans it kind of got me going on my journey. I, I took all my nursing prerequisites and I thought I was going to go to nursing school and I applied and they accepted me right away. And I said, wow, that was way too easy. So <laughs> I was talking to a doctor in the, in the ICU, an internist, Dr. Gordon, and he had said, oh man, he goes, get this Guyton physiology book, get the, you know, whatever edition yep. it is, <laughs> start, start studying this Guyton physiology book. And I had it studying right that. here. <laughs> Do you? Awesome. Good one. Yeah, it's, good one. yeah. It's such a good one, right? You know? Uh -huh. and, she said, get the guy in physiology book and start studying. And so I had studying and studying and studying. And, and I just decided, you know, I was working in the hospital and I had transferred into working. Well, I decided that I was going to go and do pre-med then. Okay. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get all my pre-med stuff done. I'm like, this, this is the way I'm like, this, this looks promising. So I got a job in the neonatal intensive care unit, which is the NICU in the hospital. And, you know, being the oldest of many children and loving kids, it's kind of a, a passion of mine our children and just being there for them as, you know, because I, I think everyone should stay young to a certain degree. Right. And I just, I don't think people stay young enough. I think we all grow up too much and we want to grow up too fast. 
but being around children was really special for me. And the NICU is a special place. And that's where I ended up meeting. Um, it was just serendipitous that I bumped into a, a surgeon in the IC in the NICU that took me under her wing and literally gave me the next she gave me such a vision and such a such an amount of you know adulation and praise and allowed me to grow into such a different person in those four years of knowing her really allowed me to publish some research with her um, to spend hundreds of hours in the operating room and really just think like wow I am destined for pediatric surgery this is there's no other way about it and I went down to U of A so University of Arizona uh, Tucson and studied pre-med, did my nutritional si- uh, nutrition, of course, always still being in the back of my mind is, wait, I got to be able to figure out this nutrition thing, right? right. So, <laughs> so studied nutritional science and was a teaching assistant and did some different things down there with that, but nutritional science and pre-med and, and it was a good student. I really loved the program. It was a lot of fun. I had good mentorship and I figured, okay, this is it. Like I'm going to graduate with this. I'm going to, you know, take my MCATs and um, I'm just going to keep rolling. And everything, the stars were just aligned. Oh, it was just amazing how the stars were just set. It was like I was training for my first half Ironman. I was volunteering at 50 miler, you know, 100 miler aid stations, you know, at ultra marathons. You know, I was just like, I was, you know, we had, I published my first paper in the journal of pediatric surgery. I mean, like you couldn't, you could not, I, I'd actually spent a whole day in the operating room with the president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. Very cool. And so all these things, I figured, okay, the stars are aligned. This is where I'm going. And on the 10th day of the 10th month of the 2010th year, I'm standing there right next to the street traffic light waiting to cross from the rec center back to campus. And a car swerves, jumps the curb to avoid an accident and hits the traffic light pole, which subsequently cracks at the base, falls over and lands on my head and my neck. Insane. That's ridiculous. Like that, I mean, honestly, you shouldn't have made it, right? Like physically, like that's very, it's very heavy, right? Totally. And I don't know, I, I, I certainly don't know why I'm still here. All I kind of come, have come to conclude is that it wasn't my time yet. Yeah, man. And I mean, just being like a chiropractor, that just hurts me even more. Just, oh, Yeah. Sure. Just the the effects on your nervous system, like that's insane. So what? I mean, what happened from there? Like you get hit. I mean, obviously you're out, right? Do you just wake up in the hospital? Yeah. So I mean, my my first rem- memories of coming to, I was I was in the. Um, I don't remember much in the first, you know. So so I don't remember much in those first, you know, few days because of the pain medicines that they had me on too. Right. Um, but I do remember when I, I do remember a lot through story that was told about that time period and through the pictures. And so what ended up happening is the traffic light pole falls, people are screaming. I was screaming apparently that people said there was like, it was in the art newspapers, like there was blood, the kid, the kid screamed a blood curdling scream. And I'm just, it it was horrible because I, going back afterwards, I saw like the the stain, the stained sidewalks where the blood was pooled and stained on, on there. And so going back afterwards, I was like, oh wow, this is where it all happened. But in that moment, I, you know, reading the police reports and, and the and the paramedic reports, combative on the scene, a traumatic, just a general, just a vanilla flavored traumatic brain injury, and the fact that I was, you know, all the symptoms and signs were just right on par with with a, with the TBI, and so that's a traumatic brain injury. So with with what ended up happening is I had punctured a lung. I had I'm trying to think between T two thoracic vertebrae two and five mm-hmm. um, were all were essentially all compression fractures. I did have some facet fractures. Some of the bones off of the vertebrae also broke, but you know, and then I had my mid brain bleed. So in the, wow. there's a place in the middle of the brain where it was, there was some bleeding going on. I had diplopia because I had double vision because uh, my trochlear, I had a palsy of the fourth cranial nerve. Um, so there was a lot of different things, of course, you know, and scalp lacerations that were full thickness. And there was a lot of, a lot of carnage um, from that accident essentially. And so I ended up in it's kind of an interesting story in the fact that, and lucky because paramedics picked me up on the scene, bring me to the hospital. I ended somehow was able to remember my dad's number. I, you know, it's so funny. If you ask yes. me right now, I couldn't tell you my dad's number, but somehow in that moment, I didn't know any number except for dads, which is so crazy. That's cell phone crazy. number. That's crazy. Well, you said this was, this is 2010, right? Right. So we weren't like 
super iPhone focus. Yeah. Right. So you actually had to remember a number or two just in case. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just have like a fact that you were in that like state. (laughs) That's impressive. (laughs) Totally. Right. So super interesting that I remembered that. And I guess my sister got a call anyways at the hospital. A buddy of mine was an anesthesia resident. And so they called him and, and he was just leaving, getting off his shift. And he ran back to the hospital and the neurosurgeon who was the neurosurgical resident who was sewing me up, he told him, he said, Hey, take care of this guy. He's my good buddy. And so he did plastic surgery. You know, he practiced plastics on my head, which he had finished a rotation through plastic surgery. And so he did a really nice suture job on my forehead. Cause I have this kind of like a little bit of a Harry Potter scar, but you don't really notice it <laughs> <laughs> because he did such a good job. So job. So anyways, my, that surgical mentor of mine from Phoenix got a call too. Um, we ended up giving, I don't know who gave her a call, maybe my mom, or maybe I said you should call her. And she came down from Tucson, or sorry, from Phoenix, down to Tucson with her girls. And she told, she was, she just took the floor. She said, she said, give me all, you know, she just, she walked up into the ICU, like she ran the place and just said, Hey, when he leaves, she goes, send, give me all of his copy of all of his medical records. And she had to sit down with me and she said, we're taking care of you after you leave here. I'm taking care of you. I'm going to, I'm going to command your care. And I don't want you to take any more pain medicine unless you need it, because I want you to be able to remember things going forward. So she's like, unless it's like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So I ended up taking, you know, some NSAIDs for a period of time, but I got off the hardcore pain medicine. So I started remembering things from there forward. And anyways, take, take it a bit. So now, now the story moves a little bit quicker. I recovered at home and under the watchful eye of an outpatient physical therapist that I was seeing three days a week. Um, I lived at my mom and dad's and I was out of school. Life was simple again. It was like, I took getting hit in the head to really refocus on life and just kind of be like, wait a second, what do I, what's really important in life? And what came to me was, okay, faith, family, friends, movement, having a purpose, something that gives you some deep purpose and some deep, you know, something that you can live of passion doing. And during the days I didn't have much to do and my memory was terrible. So having getting hit after getting hit in the head like that, I mean, I couldn't remember much of anything here. I was a straight A student pre-med and I couldn't remember much of anything. That's not, the stars are not aligning anymore, clearly. So walking the golf course, you know, I'd eat, I'd sleep good. I'd journal when I got up as much as I could focus, I'd eat food and I'd go for a walk around the golf course. And I did that twice a day, usually. So I ended up walking about 12 miles a day just to kind of give myself some peace and quiet and time away from home. That's amazing. Because I mean, you, I mean, are you in a brace at this point? Yeah. 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 I was so I mean, brace. you have to think about most people recovering from anything traumatic, especially as something as serious that you're not seeing people out there moving. Like you don't see too many people walking with, with neck braces on. Right. So that's amazing that you really knew the importance of, hey, I need to really start moving in healing my body. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think what, you know, I started reading this book called the slight edge and it's still one of the, you know, I'm going to, let me get the name of the author here. I have it handy. Uh, Jeff Olson, Jeff Jeff Olson writes it. And that book really transformed. It it reminded me so simply of the power of the very, very, very simple habits of, of compound interest, you know, essentially over time, you know, what I do today may not make a difference today, but over time, it's either going to, I'm either on the, I'm on the downward curve or the upward curve. And I was like, well, I could, I could lay around today and just kind of hang out with the dog or I could go for a walk. And, you know, being a kind of personal development guy before it, I was like, well, you know what? I should probably do something positive with my life, you know, and and, and in this moment of recovery, you know, I was doing a lot of positive things prior to, and, and I think that's probably what gave me a lot of the stuff coming out afterwards. But but I realized, okay, wait, I got to do something. So the walking was really powerful because it gave me one, it increased my circulation. I was allowed to breathe. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really, it allowed my mind to work. It allowed me to have fresh blood, oxygenated blood flowing in my brain all the time. De- detoxing the medications that you did take. Right. And so doing a lot, doing as much positive as I could. Now through all this, the traumatic brain injury, the, the memory piece wasn't really like talked about. And so I knew I was suffering. I couldn't remember people's names that I used to remember. And it was just, it was so troubling to me because I said, okay, my body can be right. But if, if my mind's not right, I don't care so much about the body. So the, the surgeon I was, you know, who was, took over my care had said, Hey, I need you to get a neuropsychological evaluation. And in her sweetest way of saying it said, you know, it seems like everything's just on par and you're doing great. 
But what I think we should do just to make sure you're a okay for med school is go get a neuropsychological evaluation. I'm like, oh, okay, sounds good. But she said it so sweetly and so nicely, and she knew I needed to hear it that way. So I've been so got a neuropsych eval and realized that oh my goodness, yeah, things were really off with my working memory. And you know, for anyone who's studied this stuff, it me it's the working memory is the stuff where you know it's the stuff you're doing by making sense of all the complex little facts and figures and pieces of bits of information and stories, and you're putting it all together to make something with that. And that really wasn't working well. And that's not going to work for what I had planned for my future. So during that recovery process, a, a TV crew came to the house from Tucson because it had been a big story and said, hey, so how's the recovery process going? And what's, what's it looking like? And so, you know, after our interview was done and they watched me walking and they're like, man, it looks like you're doing great. What's next? You know, they're always looking for a fascinating story, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, I've always wanted to bike across the country. And there I did, I committed to it in front of the TV camera. Um, <laughs> how, how long did that been like a, a thing in your mind for a while? Uh, probably since I was about 15. Okay. I, I had started biking to a job that was a ways away at an ice skating rink. And on my long bike rides between to and from work, I used to think about like, wow, what would it be like to just get lost for days on a bike? And I realized I really love bicycling. So so it was interesting. I committed to it in front of the camera and I was like, okay. And at that moment, that was just like the, it just got everything rolling. I started thinking about, okay, I got to order the maps. I got to like, how am I, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I just set the date. I'm going to leave right after school gets out. Um, and I'm going to figure out what I need to do. I just, I'm going to pick a charity that I really think, uh, would benefit and one that I believe in and we'll just move forward. And so I got back to college that, uh, after my semester hiatus in recovery, and probably a little early still to be back at, at school, but I got back and I dropped down my class load to 12, unit, 12 credits because I couldn't handle much more and was working with speech therapy on you know two to three times a week. I'd, I'd bike up to speech therapy. And, and on my other days, I figured out that my memory was really good if I audio recorded it. So you just, it was just like finding other ways to help your brain learn, like your learning, your, your ability to learn and to retain information is still there you just have to figure out a new way to do it. Right. So was it, what was it before? Was it visual before? That's a good, that's a great question. I think it was always auditory, but I think I really, what I learned in speech therapy was there was a lot of memory techniques that, you know, and, and then my speech therapist told me is that people who have traumatic brain injuries or even sometimes concussions will forget they could be a valedictorian in high school, you know, high school st- student, you know, playing football or whatever, they can have a concussion and they can forget a lot of the memory tools essentially that they used to use. So they pretty much retrain me how to use all the memory tools that I had used previously. So that was my, that was what speech therapy. And and I still think speech, and I still commend speech therapy as like, you know, the powers that help me get my life back. Right. Because it's like, okay, without a brain, how much are we? Right. Right. So yeah. So I'd sit on the bike and I'd, train, I'd go for an 80 mile bike ride around Tucson. And I just, I have my dictation, you know, device, and I would have dictated my notes into my device and I'd play it and I'd listen to it to her, you know, sometimes once, twice, if I was long enough ride, I didn't have anything else to listen to three times. And, um, I'd bring snacks with me. I had some panniers on the back of my bike and I just, (laughs) I just rode and, and, uh, for two or three days a week, I really got in some solid training and riding up Mount Lemon. And it really became just a fascination. Okay, I'm going to make this cross country bike trip a reality. And every day I woke up, I really thought about that. That's amazing. I mean, so how long was it from you did that interview? You really started taking that more seriously. Obviously, you said you started, you know, training several days per week. Like, what was the time frame from interview to okay, you're going to actually go for it? Time from the interview to go for it was probably about five months. Gotcha. Um, it was seven it, months. I mean, that's, that's pretty quick. I mean, it's, it is quick. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I had, so I certainly had a level of base fitness just from being able to ride a bicycle. So prior to the accident, uh, I had been riding, I learned how to ride a road bike. I really had never ridden a road bike and I bought one from the golf coach at the U of A and started biking Gates Pass, which is a really nice scenic bike ride in Tucson. And I'd been doing that ride prior to that TBI. Well then when, you know, the, the accident happened, it was about seven months after that 
with no no real riding for about three or four like probably four months but i pretty much put in started putting in miles back for about you know kind of like probably three months of solid like getting in a couple 80 mile rides a week minimum and then maybe like a mount lemon ride once a month which is like a for anybody who's ridden Mount Lemon, it's a beast of a ride. It's 24 <laughs> miles uphill and it's like 7,000, just it's, it climbs 7,000 feet over 24 miles and it's just like uphill the whole way. It's that's, just a grind. That's crazy. I mean, and you, and you don't have like your brace still on at this point, right? You're like you're good physically, right? Yeah. At this okay. point. So <laughs> yeah, at this point, exactly. My brace came off three months after I didn't need to have any surgeries on my brain or on my spine, which was very I just, I'm so still so thankful for that. Essentially, you know, essentially it was like, I was free of all my devices. I did have some double vision still. So I was not good there. I was still working on my memory tactics um, and recovering a good working memory, but I was, I did have double vision. And so getting into the bike ride, I mean, every one of my doctors like, no, you know, probably not the smartest idea, but if you (laughs) do it, we'll support you. You know what I mean? Kind of a thing. And so the surgeon I worked with threw, threw me a big party. And they, it was kind of a big send off. I, I created shirts and sold them and I had all the people who wanted to be sponsors on the shirt. And my mom and sister helped me a lot because I still think I was like, I was so gung ho to do things, but I didn't have like the, I had like all of the intention and the go, go, the go get it, but like less of the capacity. So mom and sister were really like just catching all the emails and all the support and this and that and helping me out with that. So that was really awesome. It hey, kind of side note question, um, Dr. Peter, like, because you did have that kind of thoracic spine damage, did it affect your like lung capacity at all? Just because like the nerve function with the lungs, did you notice that at all? Because you were fairly active before the accident. Did you notice that it took a toll on just lung capacity overall? That's a great question. Really? I didn't think about that so much. I thought about it being from like, a, cause I did have some, ver- uh, some vertebrae that were, uh, not some vertebrae, but some ribs that were actually uh, cracked. And so I was thinking, well, it's probably a rib thing, but getting back to my physical activity, I did notice a slight limitation with breathing, um, that I think I was able to, that I ended up being able to overcome, but I definitely noticed some detrimental function getting back to things. So yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah. I can't imagine like just the recovery process for you. I mean, I'm sure your level of gratitude is just like unreal because the fact that you really shouldn't have even survived that and just the physical damage that you took without having serious damage or paralysis. And then like five months later, or, um, you know, a little bit longer than I guess five months from that interview, I mean, you're getting ready to ride your bike across the country. I mean, was your gratitude level just on a whole other level? Totally. I mean, I'd come across people who, and I'd visit with them and it's like, you know, you either left them feeling inspired about life because, you know, I wasn't trying to, I was just being myself, but people really notice people notice your headspace. They really know where you're at. I mean, you, you, we know this when we're standing in, in line or we're, we're visiting with people who are in a, in a bad or a good headspace. Yep. And I was really in a good spot. I mean, mentally and emotionally, I felt like really, really good and very positive, very upbeat, very thankful. Like you said, grateful for the day that I was given and just really uh, taking each day as it came, just th- waking up very thankful for life. You know, the bike trip was probably the most fun thing I've I've ever done. I, I talk about it so much because it's like, it's such, it was such a moment. You know, I think those things in life where we just kind of throw caution to the wind and we just go for it. Those are things that we remember the most. For sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've seen that for my own life personally, your life. I mean, that, that your story just like, that's on a whole other level. And I kind of want to highlight what you just said about a second ago about you were really striving to be the person that changed somebody's energy when you like, were encountered with them because I mean honestly like for everybody listening you know you've if you've been listening to this podcast for a bit you know I've like I, I mean just the people that have shared their stories just are so incredible and every single one has been those kind of people right like the kind of people where you hear their story or you're around them and that energy that they provide and that joy and that gratitude that they have it can really change how you feel about yourself and the goals that you want to accomplish and it really can change how you feel about yourself. And I, I really hope that everybody listening and like, that's what you can really apply to your own life and just really strive to be that for other people. Because I mean, if you, like you said, you can tell if somebody's presence is bringing you up or down. I mean, right. Like you walk into 
a nursing home, you instantly feel pretty down, right? Or if you walk into, I don't even have a good example right now, but you know what I mean? Like, I think that should yes. be like everybody's listening main takeaway from, I mean, there's going to be probably a lot of takeaways from this episode, but I mean, like, if you can just strive to become somebody that you change somebody's thought process or energy just by hanging out with them and being yourself, you just bring that level of just whatever that is, whether it's gratitude or happiness or joy, and you just like protrude that out. Like, it's just, I think that's incredible. So I really wanted to like kind of highlight how you were saying that, Dr. Peter, because I, I think that's amazing. Well, it's true. I mean, we're all energy. And yeah. so at any given moment in our day, I think the the one one thing that we're we're so well connected nowadays on social media and with email, and we can really text each other. And But to be present and to connect with each individual person, I mean, that was is always something I really, I love being with the elders. I liked working in the nursing home and I was a nursing assistant. Like I like just being with people and just like listening to their, their stories. Because ev- like I said, everyone, if I'm a treasure hunter, I'm looking for a treasure in each one of these people that I encounter. And if it, it honestly, I can say that I read that, I, I must have read that somewhere and, or it was in my training at Southwestern. But that really changed my life because when I started looking for the treasures that these people around me held, it changed the way I interacted with people. It changed my life because no longer was I somebody trying to tell somebody else what to do or every single person became a teacher to me in some way. And I was grateful. And if I could be grateful for that, wow, like you just life, it's a whole new life you have in front of you. Absolutely. No, I love that. I think that's amazing. And it it kind of like, With the actual bike ride, Dr. Peter, like, I mean, you said that was one of the most fun times of your life. What were some of the challenges that you had? Because you said that's 4,400 miles, right? It was from Washington to Maine? Yes. Yep. So I started at the San Juan, I biked around the San Juan Islands and and off the coast of Washington in Puget Sound. They're probably my favorite, one of my favorite places. And I didn't find them until then, you know, but they became my favorite, one of my favorite places. And there was so much snow in Washington on the pass, the um, the old Cascades Highway that I was supposed to take. I, I here here I was training in Arizona, which is like ninety degrees in May, hundred degrees, <laughs> and I fly up to Washington, and it was like at one of the passes, it was thirty eight degrees. There was a meter on the side of the road, a thermometer, <laughs> and there was like snow was like two feet deep, you know, melting, but still there was snow. Right <laughs> on a road bike, you know, totally. And I'm just like, this is crazy. What was I thinking, you know? And so initially starting off the trip, I think the biggest challenges that I had when I was so cold in Washington, I was very well physically prepared. I, I actually, I, I realized that physically, I, after having ridden Mount Lemon a few times, I think the feather in my cap was that I, and the Dumbo's, mag, my magic feather was that I had ridden Mount Lemon a couple times with a lot of stuff like in weighted in my bag. So I, I just, I loaded myself down and I rode up Mount Lemon. I was like, okay, if I can do that, I can do anything. So feeling like that was like, okay, so the bike trip itself, I mean, the highest pass I had to climb was maybe it was around six or six or 7,000 feet. It wasn't really that high compared to what I had been used to climbing in Tucson. So in Washington though, I was so cold. I couldn't really feel my feet because I was wet and I was cold. And so I did have a tendon, one of my tendons, uh, I think it was my my tendon that attaches to my left big toe, actually my flexor hallucis longus, I think ruptured Wow. partially. So I heard a big pop and then I felt this massive (laughs) swelling in the back of my ankle. And so to lick my wounds, I kind of pulled into the first little like resort I came across and this, I was way out in like the remote areas of Washington, Eastern Washington. So like that was the very beginning. Very beginning, (laughs) very beginning. First state. I'm like, and of course you catastrophize a little bit, right? You're like, man, what if, but I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. I'm like, All right. if, if I'm not going to be maimed for life, like I'm continuing. So I called a physical therapist friend of mine. She said, yeah, you can, she goes, not ideal. Take a couple day break. She goes, you can use some NSAIDs. Of course, it's going to impair the healing process. But, you know, like she kind of gave me the pros and cons of different things I could do. And she's like, and I said, well, I am going to continue. I was like, I, you know, just letting you know. And she's like, yeah, no, I understand. You might want to get some KT taping help and figure out some other things. And so I stayed with the, uh, I had all these fun connections on my bike trip. Like I stayed with the mayor and his wife in Sandpoint, Idaho. Very cool. And it was super fun. Cause like, it was just a mutual friend. It was like, oh yeah, I have this guy. I know this guy who's biking across the country. And they said, oh, if he comes to town, have him stay with us. And so that was just the theme for the whole bike trip. Like people were so friendly. People were so loving. Even if I didn't know them beforehand, like 
people just invited me in and said, Oh, you can stay with us. Oh, what do you want to eat in the morning? You know, it was, it was very, very loving. Um, and so I stayed with them. They brought me to PT. You know, I, I kind of figured out my, what I was going to do for the rest of the trip, but that was the first major setback was that I was like, Hey, if this, <laughs> if this doesn't derail me, I don't know what is, you know, but this isn't going to. So that was the main one. And then probably the cold weather was really, uh, cold wind and rain was probably wind was probably a lot worse than the rain. Yeah. Um, because it's a constant adversity. It's like, you know, uh, there was a section in Montana where I was making like as fast as I could, I could have gotten on my bike and walked, but I had made an oath to myself. I was going to bike across the country. So I'm like, here I am kind of like, just, just battle, just grind, just mashing, right. Just pushing really hard. I was just, Oh, I was like, I got to make it. So there were some tough days. I felt kind of defeated. I made it like 30 miles. Cause it was just like the wind was so in my face. It was just, I stopped real early. I only rode for like an hour, a few hours. And I was like, I'm done. And, um, I was like, I'll just pick it up tomorrow. So those were the tough, tough days. Um, yeah. So for, that's the first one that comes to mind is, you know, the second one that comes to mind. Um, those are probably the first, those are probably the big ones and they were initial. Um, after that, I feel like, cause I think it's kind of like that in life. Like anytime we're really starting to do something that's really meaningful, like it's really tough at first. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be something that's going to, it's going to, they're going to come up like, oh, nope, you can't do this. And they're going to be instant. And there could be, the thing is, is you have to notice that they're so easy at that moment to be like, you know what? I wasn't supposed to be doing this. Shucks anyways. (laughs) Right. A hundred percent. It's just, it's too bad, you know? And, but to really realize that, and, and I'm only realizing now this, this now looking back is that after that, it was like, I mean, it was awesome. Like, I don't remember much difficulty, really. I mean, I know I had some harder days, but it was amazing. I love that you're, uh, you know, I don't know if this was a, your original game plan or not, but the fact that you were okay with like listening to your body during the trip, not like I have to get this many miles per day or I have to get to this location by this point, or maybe you did have a general overview, but I think that's super important. Like, I mean, for anything, it's just about every day you move the needle forward and like with any goal that's all that's what you have to do right so i think that that's really amazing that you didn't give up it was just each day a little bit further even if it was for a few hours well that's exactly it i mean it's like just moving the needle a bit every day i didn't really have a i knew i had a game plan i wanted to be in marquette michigan which is in the up the upper peninsula of michigan i wanted to be there for like fourth of july weekend i knew that and that's it. That's all I knew is I was like, okay, I knew I had, a, I had a rough game plan. I'd sketched out. Like I'm a wing it kind of guy. Really? Like if you know me just on a personal level, I'm game with serendipitous anything. Like it sounds cool. Like let's do it. Adventure. I'm all in. Like <laughs> let's jump from that. Cool. Let's do it. So for me, the bike trip was, I didn't have anybody to go. I was by myself. So, and I should, you know, I was by myself. I just had two packs in the back of my bike. I had a handlebar bag. Um, I had a tent on the back. I had a sleeping bag. I had, you know, two pairs of on the bike clothes, two pairs of off the bike clothes. I had grocery store food on the top of my bag. And it was like a cell phone and a wallet. Like, I mean, as do simple. A, do you have a picture weird. of yourself with all your stuff? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I need you to send that to me because I need a visual of that. Cause that's, I you mean, that's, got it. Absolutely. that's amazing. That, I mean, that's a lot of equipment. I was going to ask you cause I was pretty sure that you didn't have any kind of like crew or anybody kind of following along in any way. But I mean, to be totally by yourself, it's uh yeah, that's definitely a lot more pressure and a lot more equipment. How long did the did the trip actually take? So the t- trip took about 55 days. And and so I averaged roughly around 80, 80 miles a day calculated wise. Um, I had a lot of fun stops on the way. And so like I was saying, I really didn't take, like uh, I knew I could go a certain miles someday. One may, my longest day was 140 miles. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I had some, my average though was, was, probably, you know, 80 to 90 ish. Um, and I had a couple short days thrown in there too, which kind of threw things off, but it was a lot of fun. I had friends in Montana that I stayed with on the way. I had friend, I had a cousin in North Dakota that I stopped at. I had friends in Minnesota. I had friends in Michigan that I stayed with. I had my great grandma in Canada. Um, and that was it. Like after that, it was like New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. Like it was really quick. It was like seven days. I mean, it was like really fast biking. The East coast is like, yeah, it's really hilly, but it's not like a lot of distance to cover. The States are packed together. Right. And I know you said you had to find like the right maps and stuff. Do they have it pretty well mapped out for people that are trying to do that? Or did you have to kind of make your own 
path or places that maybe weren't as accessible for like a road bike. Well, yeah. That, and that's a good thing to know for anybody who wants to do a cross country bike trip. I mean, um, I met a lot of people doing it in their, in their middle ages, you know, I mean, forties, fifties kind of midlife crisis or wanted to get, take a break and just kind of go explore the world and never really hadn't done much. And you can go to, um, it's called adventure cycling association or maybe is it American Ac- cycling association. It's the, um, or ACA. Yeah. And the ACA makes these really cool maps that pretty much there's like, there's one for almost any part of the country that you're in and it shows you the most bikeable routes. So the most accessible by bicycle that you can take and it shows you everything. It shows you like the, like laundromats, like (laughs) co-ops, you want to stop at a library and do some blogging, (laughs) anything that you want to do, you can really like, it's all there on those maps. So it was a real blessing to have, I bought the, so the route I took was called the Northern tier. And I bought the maps. There's maybe like 11 or 12 maps or something like that. And I just got those and I got a, the Great Lakes set because I went on the Northern side of the Great Lakes into Canada. And so I got a couple different sets of maps and I was good to go really. I mean, it was an amazing trip. I mean, so, you know, I, like I said, Washington was really cold, Montana. uh, So Idaho was really fast because I was, you know, kind of the panhandle. Montana was the long, long state. I had really bad weather. They had lots of flooding. It was just, it was a really tough state on my mentally and emotionally, but I listened to a lot of Sherlock Holmes. I probably listened to his complete works about five times through Montana. <laughs> really lots of fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah. When, how, how were you like emotionally on the last day? Oh, that's a great question. The last day was, the last day was, I was kind of like, is this it? Like it's done. <laughs> right. You know, I, I had been kind of thinking like, wow, it would be like some, uh, some amazing experience to like come to the finish. And, and it was cool. Like it was neat to roll my tires into the water at Bar Harbor and be like, wow, this is awesome. I'm done. Like, but at the same time, there was a, like a momentary kind of sadness of like realizing. And I realized at that moment that all the fun that I had was all in the journey and it was not at the end. Absolutely. Every bit of it. It yeah. was like, and that was a profound realization because for me at that point, I figured, well, I was an accomplishment driven guy. Like, come on, it's, it's the thing is to say that you did it right. And it wasn't. It was the process. I, I was going to ask what was your, probably your biggest takeaway. And that was probably it, right? Yeah. Really enjoy enjoying, you know, learning to enjoy life every day because that whole day-to-day bike ride, I mean, I stopped at some more roadside farms to eat produce from people and just visit and just ask them how their life was and what their life was like and go to little like co-ops and drink coffee with the farmers in the morning and just, you know what I mean? Just like, oh, what are you guys planning? Oh, okay. We got barley and rye and okay. You know, and (laughs) just kind of really getting to know the heart of the American culture. And I was like, it was really eye-opening for me because I, you know, with all the media and the hype about various things, I mean, even back then in, you know, 2011, this was this is when I took the trip the summer of 2011, I really realized that, wow, people are really good natured and they're really fun and they love to visit. And I think that's when people really connect is by visiting. Absolutely. No, I I love that. And, you know, I've talked to, uh, I mean, quite a bit of people that have done like crazy things like that, whether it has been run across the country or ride their bike or like climb mountains or like just super like just things that really challenge them physically and mentally and basically everybody says that exact same thing it's like they expect the end to be like this just uh the end to be the life-changing moment or that end to be the big celebration but it was really just the process is you know where the, all of the good stuff is right all of the stories all of the things that changes their mindset and just i mean transforms their life so i think that's just amazing i, I love it Awesome. Yeah, no, it's so true. And I, that's why I love hearing, you know, I, I, listening to podcasts, even like your own, where you have people telling their stories and it just reaffirms to me. It's like, oh, okay. Like I'm normal. Like, they, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, you know, there's no, there's no end. There's no drug that's going to give me permanent bliss. Like there's no, nothing. like uh, you have to, it's, it's the day-to-day enjoyment of life that we should really be seeking instead of momentary enjoyment from something, uh, some, some incredible feat. Absolutely. And I love that you also mentioned the fact that just the good naturedness of, of people overall, and just the world not being as scary as it seems maybe in news or media, because like, and that's also very, very true. And like for, you know, people that, you know, that know me personally, I, I don't, I don't have the news on TV ever. Like if, if somebody has the news on, I'm like, yeah, let's change that or turn it off. Because like, 
it's so negative and it's so fear driven. Um, and then once you get out there and actually start meeting people and hearing their stories and doing cool things like you did and like travel across the world and talk to different people of all like just different diversities and just all of that, like you realize the world isn't really that scary. Like they're highlighting like the worst of the worst and it pulls you in because you want to have like, there's just as humans, like we're naturally drawn to that a lot of the times, unfortunately. So like starting your day off with the news, ending it with the news, being addicted to the negative stories on social media, like whether you realize that or not, it's affecting your mental state. And like, it's keeping you from like really putting yourself out there because you're just like living in this like constant state of fear. Yeah. And, and, you know, whatever, I mean, to get on a social media thing, I mean, whatever you start engaging in is what you're going to get more of. So, I mean, you're on Facebook trolling and you're clicking on, you know, (laughs) you know, whatever anti-Trump campaigns, like you're going to get more of that. Right. And so it's going to turn you into this person who you just hearing, you know, not, you know, not to be very specific, but you know, just one side of one story or whatever it is. Right. Like if you, you know, if it's, it could be, it could be anything really. So I think it's really important that people engage. And I think that that's one thing that's really polarizing even America is that inability for people to actually have a conversation, but to feel like we know about the other person because we've watched their social media or we've come up with some idea about something and we haven't even visited about it, you know? And I feel like when people can connect and spend that time and just be like, Hey dude, like we, you and I, we're both like, what's going on? Like, how is your life? Talk to me about your life. And you realize like, wow, that guy's a, you know, maybe he's on the different party line or whatever, but he's an amazing person. He's got a really good point, a lot of points. And I understand the whole, the whole, all this stuff, Casey, it comes down to this. If, if people could go and get and connect with people and, and seek to understand the other person, seek to understand and to listen, to understand and not ask people questions just to, and then wait for, to be able to respond. But just to, just to, if you could repeat, you know, if we could repeat back to them, like, so I heard you say this and I want you to correct me wherever I'm wrong in this. Cause I, so I think you meant to say it like that, like right. actually saying it like that, like trying to figure out what way they're, you know, everything so that they can go, that's right. Like, exactly. you know, it really, it comes down to that. I, yeah, I know and that's, that was super well said. And um, I had a guest on recently and, and I loved how she was talking about just empathy overall, because she, the way she said it, um, try not to like butcher her quote, but it was like, empathy is basically defined by separating listening from agreeing. So it's like actually hearing somebody out and being okay if you don't agree with that, but like actually like listening, but still being like supportive and loving of that person is just like, I, I like, I just thought it was like really an amazing way of defining empathy and just the, how we can just really apply that to just connecting with people and just be, yeah, like you were saying, just being okay with hearing somebody's point of view and just actually understanding it and not just trying to figure out a way in our own heads to like understand that or maybe switch their way of thinking. It's just, it's a game changer. Absolutely. I mean, there's no, if there's no goal other than to understand the other person, people would be just blown away in their lives because we think like, well, my life would be that much better if this person agreed with me, or if I was had something go this way, but actually you don't know what your best life would be like. So I'm challenging you to actually just try to understand the other person and your life might be totally changed because of the fact that you're able to connect with the person that you really didn't even care to or want to initially just going off of your own, you know, your own ego, but really just being able to ego check yourself at the door and say, Hey, this person's probably got some really like some gold nugget for me to learn. And I'm just going to totally try to understand this person and see if I can get that nugget. Absolutely. No, a hundred percent. I, I love that. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, after, I mean, man, you had that life changing experience and after a an experience, you know, that injury that completely changed your life as well. So you've gone through some very, very different life changes, like back to back to back. So like, where did it lead from there? Because I mean, you are a physician, you are, you know, more holistic with the way you practice with your patients. So how did that all implant based? So like, how did that all kind of follow from there? Um, so (laughs) yeah, it is. And it's, I can make it short and sweet really. And you can kind of unpack it wherever you want to, and you think it might be appropriate. But so in my training for cross country, as when I started listening to a podcast called, or as a radio show called nutritional wisdom, and it was an old radio show that Joel Furman used to put on. 
Very cool. And so very way back in the day, man, it was like 1990s, you know, and they like saved the episodes and you, they were archived and I like unpacked them and like downloaded them as MP3s. And you know, I'm like listening to them on my bike. And I'm like, dude, this guy, and here I am studying nutrition in college. And I'm like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And I want to study medicine, but this guy really knows what he's talking about. Like if I could do nutrition, if I could do what that guy does, I would be set. I would be so happy. I'd be helping people because what I ended up doing was I, and so I, I took it on his word that obsessing about nutrition and all that stuff, you could actually get rid of that by just adopting a primarily plant-based diet of almost all, you know, all whole foods, minimal animal products, and really just like going heavy on the vegetables and the fruits and the beans and the nuts and the seeds and avocados and mushrooms. And I mean, the list goes on. And I just said, this guy knows what he's talking about. These stories are amazing. I'm going to do it. And so that in my training is when I started adopting a nutritarian approach to my diet, you know, to my life. And so that helped me through my training. And during my cross country trip, I did eat some animal products and stuff. It was very minimal. It's like, you know, you had have yogurt here or there. Well, I mean, you really can't though. I mean, even if you weren't yeah. vegan, I mean, like you don't have that many options being out like that because things would rot, right? Right. So yeah, you're at like a gas station in the middle of Montana. I mean, it's like <laughs> you didn't have groceries, you know, and you're kind of like, okay, well, I'll get some of this. And so I did pretty good. I prepared quite well because I'd usually hit up a grocery store every day. But mentally, I just wasn't like 100% yet. Like I was like 99%. And I told my buddy, I met with a good friend of mine, Ryan Johnson, met me in upstate New York to finish the bike trip with me the last like five or six days. And so when we were biking together, I told him, I was like, dude, I don't know. I think this guy's got some. I'm going to go 100% when I get home. I was like, I don't, I, you know. And so I got home from the bike trip and I switched 100% nutritarian. I think I lost like an extra 15 pounds. Um, and it was just like... I. I it wasn't like I didn't even need to lose weight, but I, I was kind of like that struggling point where you're like, hey, because I was eating huge salads and I wasn't probably not getting, you know, I was eating salads and cooked vegetables and, but I dove right into the plant-based thing. My weight equalized. I ended up, you know, it wasn't like I kept dropping weight because I was like, wait a second, I'm losing weight to be quick doing this, you know, this nutritarian thing. Right. Because um, prior to that, I mean, I was having more salt and some animal products and things like that. And it's easier to maintain your weight when you're really physically active. So I'd kind of figure out what a new, my new, my new status and how to keep my, how to keep my energy up without losing too much weight and all that with the new diet style. And I just jumped right in and I just filled my fridge with all good stuff. I didn't look back and, um, I, because I'm more of an all or nothing person. So it's easy for me to do that. Um, so in my journey with that, I mean, I, so I, the next summer after that, I'd finished up college and I had worked, working for P, uh, for the surgeon that who was a mentor of mine. And I knew I still wanted to do something a little different. And I, I ended up shadowing a naturopathic doctor a couple of times. And I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. He spends 60 minutes with his clients. He talks about food. He talks about medicines. He talks about supplements. He talks about lifestyle. And he talks about how to optimize this person's life. And I was like, this is legitimate. Like, I like this a lot. And looked into the naturopathic. There's only seven at the time, seven uh, accredited naturopathic colleges across the US and Canada. So I looked around and I saw there was one in Tempe, Arizona, and I was like, ah, it's too close to home. It's kind of in the city. How about the one in Seattle? And just went up to Seattle, checked it out. And I just was like, I was head over heels. I was like, this is awesome. I'm in. And so that summer before I started school, I was going to do another bike trip. And I started off on the trip and I was about five days in and my left that tendon that popped on that first trip, really that part started to just absolutely throb. It was so painful. And I was like, oh man, I hadn't done a whole as much training as I did for my first trip. And so I was like, you know what? It's time to abandon ship this time because I think I'm going to do some permanent damage to this ankle. And so what I did was I, you know, so I pulled into a, a coffee shop and I started, I pulled out my, my iPad. I had an iPad with me. And I said, in a moment of pure inspiration, I emailed Joel Furman. And I just said, dude, I said, I said, Joel, you've changed my life. You know, dear Dr. Furman, you know, I could probably read you the letter. You know, <laughs> you've changed my life. I want to change people like you change, you know, I want to people change people's lives like you change mine. And I want to, I want to emulate you and I want to learn what you do. And I've heard so much. I know so much about the process. I've changed my life over to your style and I, and I want to go, I'm going to medical school. I told him I'm a first year medical student, right? I hadn't even started yet, but I told him I was. <laughs> And so I got an email back the next morning. When can you come out? That's awesome. So you, you didn't even give him any details of your actual story, right? No. That's, I didn't give yeah. him 
yeah, no, no details at all. It was just that. And he said, when can you come out? And this ended, started a, a conversation via email. And in three days we had it worked out that I would stay at one of his employees places. And I interned with him for a whole month and a half out there in New Jersey at his office. And I watched nutritional medicine, cure people up, down, left, right, sideways. It was unbelievable. And so that's when I was like, hey, I know what I'm doing when I graduate from naturopathic school. Like, this is it. That's really cool with Dr. Furman, though, too, because, I mean, you have to think, I mean, probably now more than, you know, what, what year was that? That was in 2011. 2011. Okay. So I'm sure he gets a lot more just random emails now, you know, but to have like a very non-specific email, like, hey, love what you do, basically want to come learn from you to be like, yeah, when you come in, you know what I mean? So I think that's very, very cool on his part, you know, that it all lined up like that. That's incredible. Well, he, he's in, and I caught him at the right time in his life because, you know, I think everything happens for a reason at the right times, everything happens. And that just happened. Like he had, you know, eat to live was getting, you know, it was getting, uh, it had gotten revised and whatever else. And that got put out and he had been, you know, he had written, he had written a couple books, obviously fasting and eating for health and, and, you know, cholesterol proof, um, cholesterol proof of life maybe, or, and, um, eat to live and, um, disease proof your child. And those, the core fundamental books were written and he was not, he was seeing patients, but he wasn't seeing them so much. He was writing a ton, but I did get to spend quite a bit of time with them and his associate, Dr. Benson, at their practice. And it was amazing because literally, yeah, he took me under his wing and just kind of like help, help us work on some of this stuff, like gave me projects to work on. Cause when I originally arrived, he said, Oh, okay. So what year of medical school are you in? He, I was like, Oh, I'm just, just going to start. He's like, Oh man. He's like, <laughs> I thought you'd be useful. He goes, you totally jumped the gun. He's thinking like, I'm not going to be useful. And I was like, Oh man, don't worry, man. I will, I will pay my way. You, you yeah. don't, don't worry about me. Like you just worry about yourself here. I'll, I'll get this figured <laughs> out, you know? And, um, so it was a, it was a fun summer and we've stayed friends to this day. I've I've helped him out here and there and we communicate via email and, uh, he's always brainstorming new, new things he's doing and immersions. And yeah, now he's like, he's kind of untouchable almost in the nutrition community just because he's gained so much, you know, notoriety for his work that he's done. So it's kind of cool to, you know, have been able to catch him at a period in his life where he wasn't so busy. That's amazing. No, that's just, I mean, it's really incredible just to see how everything played out when it could have gone so badly, but just the way that it played out, how it was supposed to. I, I, I love that. And so like once you, so you interned there, you went to you know naturopathic school. So after you graduated, how did it kind of progress from there? So as I went through school, I knew what I wanted to do. And so I graduated and I had been working on, so I actually transferred down to San Diego's campus last year, like right about my third beginning of my third year of school. And during my last year of school, I tra- I had been contacting him and, and we were kind of trying to figure out how, a way that I could end up working with him, which is kind of, I was like, oh, let's see if we can make this work. Right. Um, and it didn't end up working out at that time. And for, for good, you know, for probably for many reasons. And, and I think it, it was for the best because when it ended up happening is I had done a first, as a first year medical student, I had done an internship at True North Health Center in Northern California. And so having worked with Alan Goldhammer for two months, I was like, this guy is amazing. Like now <laughs> right. he takes, he take nutrition to a whole, you know, nutrition and fat, like hygiene to a whole new level. Were you into fasting before you went there or was it just after you saw all, all of the crazy results. Yep. I never, I didn't even know much about it. Actually, I was working with Joel that one summer and he said, and I asked him about, and I listened to it and I listened to a podcast or one of his radio shows and he had maybe brought it up fasting, like autoimmune disease, if it's super severe and it doesn't change with nutrition after a good prolonged period of time, you know, you definitely should look into fasting. And so I was like, interesting that he mentions that. And so I talked to him about it when I was with him that summer. And he said, no, I, I did an internship at, you know, or he was the first medical intern at what was, you know, like true North or whatever, you know, true with Alan Goldhammer essentially. And so they go way back. I mean, they're, they're good buddies from, you know, way back in the day, like when Alan was first studying hygiene, you know, so, you know, in the, in the fast that cured his foot. Right. So it's interesting. So I, yeah, I went out there out of kind of just on a whim, like, I want to see what this does. And, um, I learned a lot my first year of school. So you think about it, like I'm still like deep in anatomy and biochemistry and, the other students who I was interning with were like in therapeutics in their fourth years and really like ready to go out into the world. And I was like just learning. So it really guided my learning through all through school. And then when I graduated, I got the residency position at True North Health Center and studied as their chief resident for 
one year oversaw patient care, fasted around, you know, I saw over a thousand patients during that year. And just the remarkable power that diet, fasting, and lifestyle has on human physiology and human health and wellness is unbelievable. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard some crazy stories um, from that clinic. Just, I mean, from like, I mean, from you, from, I mean, there's actually, there's been a handful of people that have either like, you know, Dr. Ben, he was there for a little bit. It's, ah, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. If you guys are listening and you haven't looked into just how powerful fasting is, like really recommend you do that or go back to past episodes that if you see it in the title that it has fasting somewhere in there, just go back and find that because there's so many just amazing resources just showing how powerful it really is with our body's healing capacity. And have you have you ever done like a long term fast for yourself, or do you stick to mainly like intermittent that kind of thing? Um, more intermittent. I've done a seven day fast on my own. How was that? That was good. It was really actually easier than I thought it would be. Um, so especially if someone's pretty well, I mean, typically a five days, five to seven, five days is pretty without medical supervision. If someone's really, really healthy and I, I'm not giving of course medical advice by saying this, but at the same time, like I learned this from reading fasting and eating for health, Joel Furman's book. And he talked about like, Oh, if you're about five days, you know, five days is okay. If you're healthy, you don't have all these conditions and whatever else, of course you should get worked up by a doctor first to make sure that you're fine. But I did seven days at true North at the end of my residency and uh, really enjoyed it. I mean, really enjoyed the fast. Yeah, it was it was really worth it. And I think if people want to learn more about fasting, they started a new website. Uh, they've been working on it for a long time called fasting.org. And so people can dive into that and, and look more into the research. And, and True North is doing a lot of research studies right now. So sometimes they'll say we're looking for volunteers with, you know, X, Y, or Z. And you could check yourself in and they pretty much cover some of the expenses for the research and you get to be a research participant and it's really neat. So they're working with, they're working with Mayo, the Buck Institute, you know, Luigi Fontana. I mean, they're, they've got some incredible stuff going on. That's really cool. No, I think all of that is so interesting and I'll definitely put that link in the show notes. That way people can just go click and check that out because I think that would be an amazing resource for that. And, you know, since, I mean, obviously you were very fortunate to have all of that education throughout your like, I mean, basically your entire career as a student, which is, you know, put you ahead of the game and you were able to learn a lot more really quickly and have that direction on how you wanted to care for your patients. Because I think that, you know, just as a physician in school, you're learning so much and you're, you're learning the material that's going to help you pass boards basically, you know? So Mm -hmm. you don't always, unless you're really putting yourself out there, you don't know how you really want to practice or what you want that interaction to be like with patients and how you want to like make care plans and handle that. So I think that you being able to have that experience, the care that you can give your patients right away is amazing. Well, and that's what I've, that's what I've kind of, I think that's what some of my patients see too. And that's some of the reasons that they come to me is because they're like, well, I know that nutrition and, and, and lifestyle can, can, you know, I've tried all kinds of things, but I've heard that it can really do amazing things for me. And I'm like, you bet it can. Let's, you know, and set them up on a plan and really patient directed plan. Uh, I know I do a lot of patient directed medicine too. Like I, I, I want to really create a therapeutic alliance with every single person that sits across from me and sits with me in my space and create a space where the therapeutic alliance is the guiding thing throughout through which all of the plan is delivered. Now, if I have a hunter sitting across from me and it's like, cause I, cause I still preach I'm not dogmatic about what I do. And overall, I've seen that in life, dogma usually ends up failing people at some point. And I might get a little bit of flack for that. But overall, I think that if we can take an approach of like, like we talked about understanding the other person where they're at, whatever else, really trying to meet people where they're at, but at the same time, pull them towards maybe some help, help them discover their ideals for their life and bring them to that place. Because I've always been really frustrated in my past, when I always tried to pull people up to like the ideals that I had set for them. And I really realized that, oh my goodness, wow, like get hit in the head to, to realize that, you know, people don't need what you've got. They need what they can discover for themselves that yep. they want out of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. No, I think that's, that's incredible. And with, you know, the work that you're doing right now, I mean, do you want to talk about what you're doing with LifeDoc and just everything that's happening right now? Yeah, absolutely. So in my in my practice life doc, so I see a lot of type two diabetes, um, autoimmune disease, and you know, just people really struggling with 
people really struggling with those two categories specifically. Um, and, and so by helping people who are at whatever stage they're at, but they want to start adopting some changes, I can get people off of their medicines fairly quickly and get them to, you know, losing weight, um, maybe normalizing, you know, their, their lab values, but really just letting them know that I'm their support in this journey on their health journey with them. Like I, they have my cell phone number. They know that they can contact me if they need something. You know, it's not like a, it's not a, it's more of like a, like I said, it's not like a doc. It, it is a doctor patient relationship, but on, on a certain level, it's like, Hey, I'm like, I'm your coach. Like I'm right. a doctor coach and really taking people on that journey with type two and, uh, and autoimmune diseases. Now I get people coming in cause I'm a primary care provider. I can prescribe medications and I can do things like that in my office. But the, the, the license for me to do that, the nice thing about having that is someone comes in on a certain dose of like a statin drug or a high blood pressure agent, I can wean them down before I cut them if it's something that I need to wean. Now, a statin drug, for example, if someone doesn't need to be on it. I mean, I've seen people in my office with cholesterol like 100, you know, wow. and they're on a statin drug. And I'm like, you are crazy. Like, no wonder you're struggling <laughs> with dementia and muscle aches. And right. you know what I mean? It's just, it's insanity. We're treating the numbers. We're not treating the people. That's that's the issue. Yeah, because there, there's so much. I mean, yeah, because I mean, our bodies aren't you know compartmentalized. You know, it's we, we're so it's so symptom driven, which is why I love everything that you do. Because yeah, like you said, we're not treating numbers. You're treating a person that has real life issues going on. You know, it could be something. You know, it could be stress related. It could be what they're eating. It could be that they need to fast or you know whatever it may be. There's not just a magic pill, which, you know, you've witnessed that firsthand, right? So it's just like, I think that's just so amazing that you bring that level of care to your patients. So, you know, with LifeDoc then, is that local or do you work with people all over remotely as well? Yeah. So I do a lot of coaching people, helping people remotely. So I have patients across the country and then some in uh, the UK and then uh, help some help some in Finland as well, since I have a background in some Finnish heritage, there's some people over there too. So yeah, I don't, I don't do the, of course I can't treat as a physician, but I can help people and guide them on that journey. You know, so if they're like, well, this is something you might want to ask your doctor about, or this is a drug that is going to cause these symptoms. So if you start experiencing this, you need to tell your doctor that you, you know, this, and so kind of be their advocate on that journey of recovery. No, I love the work that you're doing, Dr. Peter. And is there anything going on in the future that you just want to put out there and share anything you're working on or just continue to do, you know, your coaching and really leading people with their healthcare? Oh, it's a, it's, <laughs> I'm always a guy with a, quite a few different little irons in the fire. <laughs> Any and bike rides? <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Right. I know. Right. I'm not going to commit to anything publicly this time on the bike ride thing. <laughs> 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 But um, right now I am working on that book and the cool. book that's talking about the actual traumatic brain injury, the recovery process, what that looks like. And um, another uh, book that is also kind of in the works is kind of putting, I'm trying to figure out um, and I'm putting together a book about basic treatment guidelines for, you know, various conditions that I work with a lot. I do, you know, of course I do weight loss too, but with, you know, with the heart disease, with type 2 diabetes, with autoimmune diseases, with digestive problems. I have a lot of people with clients with ulcerative colitis, so I can help get them off their medicines and stuff like that too. It's kind of like another fun project that I enjoy working on because I really feel for those people who've got digestive issues. So anyways, there's a whole host of things, but I want to put together a separate thing on that, kind of helping those people, but indirectly just kind of giving them some some ideas. When do you think the uh, book's going to come out? Well, that, uh, so rise again, that's the name, uh, and it, you know, rise it again works well with your last name, right? It does. Yeah, I know. It just <laughs> so happens to be that, you know, it was one of those things I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this works out so well. So rise again is um, we're looking at the end of this year for sure. Um, so that's something that I've been working on quite a bit and I'm, I'm looking forward to get that out there. Awesome. Well, be sure to keep me posted when it comes out because I definitely want to promote it on my end and, and share it as much as I can. So awesome. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Casey. You're the you are you're the best. Awesome. Yeah. And, and what is the best way, um, Dr. Peter, for people to follow you? That way they can keep up with your journey as well, everything you're working on, and also stay in the loop whenever your book comes out. Yeah. So they can um well, I guess on Instagram I, so Instagram's kind of a fun thing for me. I like to adventure and go hike the Grand Canyon, take day trips and stuff like that. But I take pictures. Instagram uh, is just at life doc and that's spelled L I F E D O C. Um, and then Facebook is at life doc A Z. So, 
um, just add an AZ as an Arizona onto the end of life doc. So that those are the two ways. Of course, my email, if someone, anybody has any questions and just wants to reach out to me, it's, you know, and we could probably put it in the show notes, but Dr. Risen and at life doc, AZ.com. So uh, we'll, we'll spell that out for you. So, you know, but anyways, those are probably the easiest ways. If someone wants to give my office a call, feel free. Um, you know, if someone's got some concerns, they want to talk through something, you know, complimentary consultation, I can always do that too. So, yeah. Perfect. Awesome. No, all of that information I'll put in the show notes. That way you can just go click and give him an ad and keep up with everything that he's doing. And Dr. Peter, just closing question that I ask every guest. But if you just had one piece of advice for the audience, maybe it's been your biggest takeaway on your whole journey so far. But if you just had one piece of advice to give, what would it be? Seek to understand. It really is. It, it comes down to that in life. I mean, it's our personal lives, it's our work lives, and it, life isn't life without people. And so if we can be there for each other and listen to each other and understand each other, there's less, you know, I think life is. It's, it's transformed my life and the way that I work with people and just how, how I see the world. And I wish, if, I wish everyone could experience, experience that. Awesome. No, that's perfect, Dr. Peter. And just thank you so much for taking time to come on. I mean, your story is amazing. Thank you again, Dr. Ben, for connecting me. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, you're incredible. And I'm just excited to share your story and to share your book very, very soon. So just thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been awesome to be to be a part of this. And like I said, you know, Casey, you're you're amazing, and you inspire so many people with what you do. Um, that work, you can't really put a price on it. You never know who you're going to touch in some remote part of the world who's listening to your podcast. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten comments from people whose lives you've changed with the material that you've posted. But I think all of our journeys have all started by hearing something amazing from someone that was just, it just happened to be on. And so you don't know how many people that you're touching with the content and the things that you're putting out there, you know, so frequently. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you guys so much again for listening to today's episode. I hope you loved my conversation with Dr. Peter. He's doing so much positive work, so be sure to give him a follow on social media to keep up with everything that he's been working on. You can find his social media links that we talked about in the episode in the show notes, but you can also find them on my website as well at drkaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. Click on the Listen tab. Then from there, you'll be able to see all of the past guests that have come on the Unlock Wellness podcast, read a little bit about each guest, and be able to click on their social media links, websites, all of that. So all of Dr. Peter's information can be found on my site as well. If you guys loved today's episode with Dr. Peter, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. Thank you guys so much again for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you loved it. I hope it inspires you. And most importantly, I hope you take action.